Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video episode on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House taking a look at some of the cool guns that they've got coming up for sale in their March of 2015 auction. Now, the Webley Company is probably familiar to most folks as a rather famous manufacturer of revolvers in Great Britain. And they did actually experiment, and in fact in, put into large-scale production in some cases, a number of automatic pistols as well. Now, this began in about 1903. The British Army had rejected the, uh, the Webley Fosbury automatic or self-cocking revolver uh, for military service. And with that no longer in the picture, the Webley Company decided that it wanted to try its hand at making a dedicated automatic pistol for military service. This gun was designed by one of their chief designers and engineers and production specialists, William Whiting, uh, who would go on to have a very long and uh, loyal career with the Webley Company. Now, the very first version in 1903 was made in 38 caliber, but of course it was bumped up to 455 caliber to meet British Army requirements. And this, this really was a pretty ambitious undertaking for, for the company. Uh, Britain had passed a, uh, a pistol law in 1903 that significantly restricted the rights of individuals to own handguns, and that law had had a significant impact on the Webley Company's sales. They dropped something like 30% um, in just a year or two because it was simply harder for people to buy revolvers, and that was what the Webley Company made. So they kind of uh, threw a Hail Mary sort of pass to try and develop this automatic pistol, um, a nice modern pistol for the British military. Now the, very, the first version, like I said, was 38. The first 455 caliber version was the model 1904, and we're lucky enough to actually have one of those here today to take a look at. So why don't I bring the camera back here, and let's take a close look at exactly how this behemoth of a pistol works. All right, so this, the Model 1904, is a particularly massive, huge pistol, as you can kind of see holding it in hand. Uh, it did have a magazine of seven cartridges of 455. Now, we have a magazine release here. Interestingly, is actually built into the magazine itself. I push that back. Pushing it back pushes in this little dowel tab. That's what locks it into the front of the magazine well. So I can pull this out, a little tight in there, but there's our magazine, follow our tab right there. This does lock open when it's empty, which is a nice touch. Now, the pistol itself is a short recoil design that uses a pair, actually, of, of two separate locking blocks to lock up, single action only. We have our hammer back here, so our manual safety is over here on the left side of the pistol, down, the current position is for firing, up, puts the gun on safe, in safe, of course, won't drop the hammer. What's kind of interesting is that racking the slide will actually disengage the safety, and that's a deliberate feature. You can see we're now in, set in fire mode. Now, so this is short recoil, so when you fire, the barrel, the whole barrel and, and slide assembly moves back, just that far, and then the slide opens back here. I'm going to go ahead and put the magazine in so that that will lock open and we can take a closer look inside. So there is the slide all the way locked back. Pretty massive thing again. These cutouts in it are simply to reduce weight. There's our breech face. Now, one of the other cool things about this Webley is that it's actually very easy to disassemble. So first, I'm going to drop the slide by dropping the safety, like that. And then, we have this screw on the side that the curious will notice says locked on one side and open on the other. What might that do? Well, let's find out. The slot in this screw is actually designed to be operated with the rim of a cartridge. And this is just an eccentric screw. It doesn't actually unthread. It just rotates. Well, you look at that. When I rotate it to open, the breech assembly goes, the, the slide assembly moves just slightly forward. And, in fact, it all comes right out of the gun. And then the barrel assembly drops right out as well. Isn't that cool? So if we take a closer look at the slide, you can see the lightning cuts here. And then this slot is what the safety operates in. 
The reason that uh, racking the slide will disengage the safety is because of this angled cut right here. If we look inside the pistol here, you can see I've got the safety lever here, which is operating this tab right there. When the safety's up, that tab is up. When it's down, it's down. So the angled cut here will push that tab down and automatically disengage the safety. Next thing we can look at is this. This vertically sliding block is one of the two blocks that keeps the gun locked. You'll notice it's got an angled surface here at the bottom, in the front, and an angled surface at the top rear. Everything in this pistol pretty much is done using cams rather than springs. So, when the pistol is locked up, this uh, block is pushed up into this cutout. So right there, you can see when this is up, it locks the barrel into the slide. When it's down, these can operate freely. In the gun, in the frame, there is a groove down here. So when this is fully forward, right here, there's no cutout in the frame, and this locking block is forced upward. When the slide assembly recoils backward, once it gets to this point, that locking block drops down and no longer holds the barrel. Now the second locking surface in this gun is even more interesting. It's this one right here. You can see when this is pushed up, we have just a little bit of an exposed surface right here that locks against this block, which also functions as the recoil buffer slash stop for the slide. So that holds this down. When the slide assembly goes backward, that gets cammed just slightly like this, unlocks there, and allows the pistol to cycle. The other interesting thing about this particular locking block, or locking tab, is that it's directly connected to the feed ramp, as you can see. So when the pistol is in recoil, when the, lock, when the slide is open, the feed ramp actually drops down slightly, which aids in feeding of the next cartridge. Once it's locked up, the feed ramp lifts up. At that point, of course, it's not really necessary. Let's see, what else do we have to take a look at? This tab here is the ejector. It travels in this long slot in the slide. Um, also, interestingly, we have a two-piece firing pin inside. So you can see on the back, this is a spring-loaded firing pin. On the front, however, I can push the rear piece in release that, firing pin goes in. So clearly they're not a single component. Rear sight. The rear sight is dovetailed really deeply in there and it has a little adjustment screw for windage. And you've got some nice little uh, lines there on the top of the slide to keep track of where exactly you've got the slide. I'm sorry, the sight. nice big extractor. The very early experiments with this pistol were done in standard 455 Webley revolver ammunition, which is of course a, a rimmed cartridge. They, not surprisingly, determined that they had serious problems keeping, preventing rim lock in the magazines. So the Kynock company actually developed a rimless 455 Webley cartridge specifically to use in this pistol and in some of the, the subsequent versions that would be more successful. Uh, interestingly, the British military, one of their concerns about going from a revolver to an automatic pistol was this notion that an automatic pistol couldn't run effectively with uh, solid lead unjacketed ammunition and that any type of jacketed ammunition, the, the lighter density of the jacket would reduce the weight of the projectile and thus uh, reduce the, the stopping power of the projectile to an unacceptable degree. Now this, I don't think that's really a valid concern. 
Um, but it's interesting that when Kynock developed the ammunition for this pistol, uh, one of the primary types that they made was actually a jacketed soft point. All right, the one other cool feature I want to show you is the actual recoil spring in this pistol. This is fairly typical of Webley Automatics. They did this in almost all the versions, including the, the much more commercially successful 32 and 25 caliber versions. Instead of having a coil spring anywhere in there, which sharp-eyed viewers will have noticed was missing, they actually have a big V-spring. That is connected to this arm, which sits in a slot in the side of the slide, and when the gun cycles, we're compressing that V-spring like that. So, pretty clever way to avoid needing to leave the space for a, a coil spring somewhere up in the slide assembly. Ultimately, this pistol was not successful. It was tested by the British government. Um, the very first test went well enough that the uh, Small Arms Committee requested an additional 10 guns and 10,000 rounds of ammunition for further testing. Um, it then went to both Army and Navy officers for testing. The Army, frankly, really didn't like it. They recorded 56 malfunctions out of 350 rounds in one particular test. Uh, and basically, the Army was uh, against the very idea of adopting an automatic pistol. Uh, they thought the revolvers worked just fine and that something like this didn't offer any significant advantage. The Navy, however, was more interested. Um, they had a lot of the same types of malfunction, but they approached this gun much more open-minded and they were very much more interested in it. So a couple of the specific complaints that they had. For one, they said the safety was too loose, which is kind of interesting on this particular gun. The safety is, in fact, rather loose. Uh, the complaint was it would be too easy to accidentally engage or disengage that safety while you were drawing the pistol. And I can certainly see that being a legitimate complaint. Uh, they also complained that it was a little too sensitive to dirt or grit, which also makes sense um, given the craftsmanship in that design, there's not a lot of space for, for dirt that might get in there. And they complained that it had excessive recoil. So Webley, at that point, didn't have the funds to further pursue the project, so they tabled it for the time being. They would come back to it later, but their next project was to take this pistol, scale it down, and make a more commercially viable uh, pocket pistol, basically. So only a very small number of these survive today. This is number 23, and only at most a couple dozen were made in the very first place. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. This pistol is of course up for sale here in the March of 2015 auction. If you'd like to have it yourself, I'd say go ahead and click on the link below that will take you to the Julia catalog. This specific pistol is lot number 2255, so you can look it up and find the, the high resolution pictures, the catalogers description, and all the information you need to place a bid online or come down here in person and check it out. Thanks for watching.